Now you get to meet the man who really is behind the brains of a media. Every week for the last, going on now half a decade, Professor Manning has taken time to influence and shape the DNA that goes into making a media the most human AI that you can find in the market today. So I, I would not bore you with too much of the mathematics, but I think that uh, it's, I have learned a lot from Professor Manning and listening in on some of the calls on Thursdays. And I, would, I consider it a, an honor for you to be here and so maybe, maybe we want to try and have this conversation about the, the impact and the outcomes that AI is achieving. And I want to start by asking you, as opposed to token-based understanding, where you were understanding words, engrams, individual words, how has your research on the embedded language model vectors allowed technologies like Amelia to develop contextual awareness as opposed to atomic words? Uh, what is the difference of understanding a context, if you could explain that? OK, I'll get there. But maybe I'll actually go back to a bigger picture before getting to okay. answer that question. Um, I guess in the earlier session, I was looking through some of the tweets that have been posted um, for this Digital Workforce Summit. And I was seeing a couple that were saying things like, oh, um, Chayden Dubey was on stage talking about cognitive, but that's really misleading. Um, what the, our computers do is nothing like cognition, that you know if you're going to do these things, you have to define interactions and you have to script your interactions. But I'd like to suggest, you know, if that's the way you're thinking, you're really thinking about last decade's technology. And in the current decade, there's been an absolute revolution in the use of deep learning techniques, so sort of reinvention of neural networks to be, give us a new means of doing machine learning and defining much more human-like interactions. Now, our artificial neural networks, they're a mathematical abstraction. It's sort of a lot of matrices and vectors, and you can, you know, various statistical physicists have been getting into interest in it because there's some technical similarities. So it's not really like the details of neuroscience, but it's inspired by some of the ide same ideas. And this has given us a new era of systems which are very much based around machine learning in various ways. So that's where there are ideas now where we can learn by imitation. We can see how human beings are doing a task, and our systems can automatically to learn how to do a task in the same way, in a human-like way. Um, so that was all very big picture. So again, closer to no, Jason's no. actual question. Um, this revolution has come to natural language understanding in terms of how we represent and understand words. So in traditional NLP, words were just words, that we had the word contract and we had the word liability, and they were just, you know, each word was a different word. But what we found is we can get a lot more power by representing words as vectors of numbers. That sounds kind of weird when you first hear it, like why does a word become a vector of numbers? But it gives us a powerful way to represent the meaning of words so that we can understand word similarities and phrase similarities in very flexible ways. And in particular, most words just don't have one meaning. Most words have many, many meanings. So a word like contract has one um, meaning in a legal context, but it has a totally different meaning when you're watching a gangster movie. And so we have to understand um, the meaning of words in context. And new machine learning methods, such as these embedded language models, are giving us much better ways to understand the meaning of words in context. Yeah, and that's, that's really something that we have benefited incredibly from. So thank you for sharing that. Extending that into learning, when, when you look at learning and some of your other pioneering work on contextual LSTMs again, deep neural networks, 
Can we benefit from the conversation and how Amelia has benefited from the conversation of like volumes and volumes of chat data? So large corporations, we were just talking to UBS and others, have assimilated copious amounts of data of calls coming in. How can we use, I mean, what we have learned from you is the thought vectors and we have learned contextual LSTMs, particularly the contextual LSTMs. And how, tell us about how you can actually say organizations can benefit from looking at the conversation that we are having right now and benefit from the billions of records of conversations that they have in the past to be able to provide meaningful uh, responses to this. Yeah. So many, many organizations have handled hundreds of thousands of support calls and commonly in many circumstances, they may have already extracted various kinds of knowledge bases of what are the answers to the kind of questions that come up. But even if you haven't, even if you've just got a mountain of support calls and you, which we can now sort of, they may be in text form or can fairly easily convert to text form using speech recognition, that that's a gold mine of knowledge. And in the best case, a human is well aware of the most common kinds of knowledge they need, but typically there's all sorts of knowledge in there that some maybe second or third level support person used at some point to solve a question. And so now um, with our modern models, for question answering, such as contextual LSTMs and other similar models we're deploying. There's other acronyms like BIDAF for bidirectional mm -hmm. attention. Um, that what we have is using some of these deep learning ideas, we've got very successful methods where we can take a new customer's problem and say, let's find someone who had exactly the same problem and deep learning has given us just a great deal of new power to match that very well. And then we can make use of the answer that that person was given, assuming the problem is successfully solved the last time. And we can very easily route that information to the new person. And so therefore, they can get this information immediately without having to spend 20 minutes on hold or they can get it outside business hours like the NTT speaker was talking about. That is absolutely brilliant. And we are indebted to you having shared that research with us, which has allowed Amelia to be able to learn in ways from transcripts of tons and tons of data, exactly as you pointed out. Now, and the differences in systems like, let's say, Google Duplex and others that also you've advised, domain restricted, where the intent is known, is a, diff is a different problem where you are saying, I already know the intent, I want to make an appointment at a salon. As opposed to when a call is coming in to Met from MetLife and the person is asking us, hey, by the way, I'm actually moving from the state of Ohio to this and I have with this company and I want to be able to now get a similar insurance with a similar code in this other state in New Jersey. Trying to diagnose the intent and um, accurately lead the person the problem is a different a domain restricted problem versus unbounded relatively in domain. Comment on that, Professor, for us. Yeah, so I think developing this capability, which we've really been working hard on for Amelia, is just absolutely, absolutely essential. I was thinking about this um, last week, actually, when I'd headed to the CVS pharmacy to pick up a prescription. <laughs> Um, now, initially, I was annoyed because there are three people in line in front of me, but, you know, I decided to be a good scientist and um, get some data here on customer <laughs> interactions. And what was, what was really remarkable is, you know, each one of those three people in front of me wanted to do something else at the same time. They didn't just want to pick up their prescription. So the first one wanted to, you know, talk about details of taking the medicine and sort of say that, um, you know, what happens if they slept till noon, what do they do about the morning dose and things like that. The second one had heard that this CVS is going to be moving to a new location and wanted to know where it was. Um, and the third one 
one just wanted to talk about the baseball results. Um, but in all three cases, they were sort of interleaving the transaction of picking up stuff at the pharmacy with having this other conversation going on at the same time. And that's just so typical of what happens in human interactions. And humans can just seamlessly interleave the topics as well as just moving between topics. And so that's an absolutely essential capability if you're going to have a successful cognitive agent. It just doesn't work if it's this kind of old-fashioned last generation agent where it's, okay, first of all, we choose an intent. Okay, you're going to be picking up a prescription and then the only thing it can do is sort of repeat over again. Um, can you tell me what your um, doctor's name is for picking up a prescription? Um, that's, again, that's perfect now how it highlights the fact that the biggest challenge with deep contextual understanding is to be able to understand the intent and to be able to actually navigate the solution as opposed to saying, I want to pick up a prescription. You're already declaring your intent or I want to make a salon reservation. You're already declaring your intent and I think the domain gets much more restricted and bounded in that case. I would, uh, and again, that's something that we are thankful for. So continue that forward. How, uh, so we have learned a lot from you about and particularly your research in this field, about how to disambiguate what humans are saying. I want, I need, okay, what do you need? Well, I want uh, something to do with my account. Okay, is it checking account, is it savings account, is it money market account? You have done some pioneering work in tokens regex, and uh, in clarifying QAs and T-surgeons that are your technologies that allow us to be able to, your research that Amelia benefits from, allows us to be able to generate the disambiguating questions so that you can act human in being able to ask for elaboration and clarification as you disambiguate between the choices that you have got in your semantic memory, which typical chatbot systems don't have the benefit of. Yeah, so the, f the first part that's essential is sometimes you know, chatbots kind of aren't anything much more than just a script to go through and answer some questions and get some information. And so one of the, the first big differences is underlying that there's much more a model of knowledge and reasoning so that we have ontologies underlying Amelia. We have process models of the kind of things that you can do at a bank or an insurance company or whatever it is. But that means all the time we have to be managing this mapping from the surface form of natural language into places in the ontology or the kind of process that we're going through. And you know, that's a hard thing to do. It's not that we can do it with 100% accuracy yet, but Chaitan is confident we will be able to by 2025, <laughs> so we'd better keep working hard. Um, but I mean, again, this is a place in which we need to try and detect intents, and so that's working on similarities between meaning and disambiguation between meanings. But often what human beings say is sort of general unclear, maybe interpretable, but humans can succeed in conversing naturally because when they're not sure of something, they'll ask for a clarification. And so what we're also wanting to do is in a natural way to be able to ask further clarifying questions to make sure that we're doing the right thing. That's right. And, and again, thank you for your research in tokens, regex, that has really helped us start to ask, ask those disambiguating questions. And I'm confident in your research getting us there, Professor Manning, by 2025. But I think the, uh, the other part, and obviously I'm too impassioned about the topic of semantic understanding, and I think you could see that in the morning that, uh, uh, that um, I could talk about that for a long time. I will just ask of you, Professor Manning, for the last minute, tell us the future. What do you see? And you, 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 I remember one call where you were talking about the exponential times we're living in, and the pace is not just the Murphy's 2x, but it's actually exponentially increasing. The research is going forward at a very fast pace. So tell us about the future. So, I mean, we're in a period of amazing progress in artificial intelligence, and a lot of that initial process was at sort of closer to sensory tasks. So there's been this amazing 
progress in computer vision, which is sort of leading into this, these developments where things like autonomous driving is seeming possible. And there was amazing progress in um, speech recognition, which means that sort of now pretty much if you talk to your phone, that it actually just understands brilliantly what you're trying to say. And what we're now trying to do is push up from those levels to higher levels of cognition, to be, be getting from sort of simple sensory stuff to actually having much deeper forms of understanding and to actually have some kind of models of thoughts. And when you're, at, so deep learning is a way of sort of moving up to deeper levels of abstraction. And our goal is that if we can kind of keep on moving to deeper levels of abstraction, we'll have a way of representing thoughts that are somewhat like human thoughts. So on the surface, the world is messy, right? The, the signals that come out of my mouth are completely messy sound waveforms if you start to look at them um, in a kind of spectrogram analysis. But you never notice those messy sound signals because after they go into your ear, they start getting decoded by your brain and moved up in levels of abstraction. So you sort of hear the words, but mainly you hear the thoughts. And so what we're wanting to do is do the same kind of disentanglement so we can have our machines understand the thoughts. And that's the kind of way in which we're trying to push deep learning technology today. Um, if I say just one more sentence, um, I think another crucial way we're trying to push things is doing more abstracted forms of learning. So a lot of the early advances were doing what was called supervised learning, where someone sits down and says, here's an example, here's its label, next example, next label. And that was very effective for, put, for building various kinds of machine learning systems. But right at the moment, there's a lot of work that's trying to push into new forms of learning with names like reinforcement learning and imitation learning, where precisely the goal is, gee, if we see a human being performing some tasks like answering a customer call, working out who to refer to some problem to, we should just be able to learn from seeing actions in the world so that the computer could work out how to perform things um, better next time. So that's also a really exciting exciting area that's really advancing now. Exciting indeed, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, the brain behind Amelia, Professor Manning. <laughs> Absolute problem. Thank you very much. <laughs>